Thank you, Rob. And good morning. It's great to see people and uh, see faces and the other half of your face. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Phillips. I'm the associate pastor here. Uh, and Billy's uh, in Shenandoah. I'm breaking his cover. Uh, so we pray they, they have a refreshing time, even despite the weather. And uh, Pastor Billy gave me special permission here this morning. We're staying in, the, in our series on Acts, uh, God's mission, God's power, God's people. But we're jumping ahead six chapters from where we were last week from the time of Eutychus being raised from the dead. And we're jumping ahead uh, to, uh, so I can preach my first missions sermon at Cornerstone. I'm pretty excited. So Saul of Tarsus was arguably one of the most famous Jews of the first century. He went from a privileged Jewish education in Jerusalem under Gamaliel to a zealous anti-Christian fanatic breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, says Acts 9.1, to being a radical Jesus evangelist right in Damascus after his conversion and then proclaiming in the Jewish synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. He became a pastor for a while in Antioch, and then he became, of course, a missionary. And we find him in today's passage as one of his last roles, which was an apologist. I don't know if you know that word, but it's a defender of the Christian faith before high government officials in this case. And perhaps he even shared his faith with the Roman Emperor Nero. Well, remember back in Acts 9.15 that the Lord told Ananias that Paul was his chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles and kings. Specifically, he was, it was told he would, he would proclaim the gospel to kings. So in today's passage, we find him before a king. It's King Agrippa. And he's in the coastal town of Caesarea. We'll see some pictures in a moment. Unlike Jesus, during his earthly life, who with the exception of that childhood trip to Egypt, never traveled very far from his hometown, well, Paul's missionary journeys took him to islands such as Cyprus, Crete, and Malta, to provinces all across the Roman Empire in modern-day Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Greece, Italy, and if church history is accurate, as far west as Spain. Now, travel may sound exhilarating to many of us, but I can tell you from personal experience, it's often a lot more pleasant to visit foreign countries on the travel channel than to face the cross-cultural challenges face to face. Paul's calling to proclaim the risen Lord of the Gentiles was far from easy. And what's happening here in chapter 26 is Paul's final testimony about his conversion. We actually have three accounts of Paul's conversion in the book of Acts. Uh, there's the first, uh, Luke's original telling of the event in chapter 9. And then there is Paul's defense trial in Jerusalem, a couple chapters before this, chapter 22. This third telling of his conversion takes place in the coastal town of Caesarea. You can see here on the map, it's just a little bit northwest of Jerusalem. And this testimony occurs at a trial before King Herod Agrippa II, the great-grandson of Herod the Great. Now, you might remember, Herod the Great was the king who had ordered the slaughter of the infants in Bethlehem, trying to murder the Lord Jesus. Well, the same Herod the Great, who had felt so threatened by the message of the wise men, had built this port city of Caesarea, right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. He erected luxurious palaces and public buildings, a theater, and what you see here in this picture with the red arrow, an amazing amphitheater overlooking the sea. And Caesarea was actually the host of its own Olympic Games. Now, this is going to look familiar to some of you because I understand that the Pastor Dave Strombeck and Pastor Mark Van Gils took a group of you to Caesarea, and you might recognize this stadium. Well, the audience hall mentioned in Acts 25-23 may well have been this very amphitheater which is still standing today. So imagine the spectacle of Paul being brought into this large auditorium. Here's what it says in chapter 25. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, that's his sister, came with great pomp 
and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, that's the governor, Paul was brought in. So just imagine all these prominent men, the military parade, the governor, and King Herod and his sister all sitting here getting ready to listen to Paul. Now the reason Paul was giving his defense here was that the governor Festus needed a charge with which to send Paul to Rome. Paul had appealed to Caesar during his earlier trial, but a charge in violation of Roman law would be needed in order to keep him lawfully in prison. So that's the background. Now we're going to actually read God's Word. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we open your Word, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we could see clearly, that we would be changed by your Word, that it would be living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. In Jesus' name, amen. So Acts 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day, And for this hope I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, But when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God. 
And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Thanks be to God for his word. Well, Paul was an enigma. He was a tough nut to crack. He had been absolutely dead set against the followers of Jesus. How can we understand Paul's anger against the early Christians? Why did Paul have such a strong anger against the church? Well, we can only speculate. Perhaps it was jealousy. He could not stand a band of uneducated men and women challenging the powers that were and gaining such a large following. The Christian church had already grown to 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Maybe it was Stephen's boldness to call the Jewish leaders murderers and uncircumcised in heart. What we know for sure is that Paul, himself a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, this Paul had great zeal against Jesus' followers. Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, hated Jesus' name. And in his testimony here in Acts, Paul proclaims his desire to silence the name of Jesus, to make the Jewish believers deny that name. That's what it means in verse 11 when we read that Paul tried to make them blaspheme. He was trying to suppress the name of Jesus. So what happened to Paul that made him change from a persecutor of the way to its greatest missionary? What transformed him from a Jewish zealot into the greatest missionary to the Gentiles? How can we explain Paul's transformation? Well, this morning we're going to look at three things that changed Paul forever. And we will consider how the Lord Jesus may transform us. First, Jesus called Paul by name. Jesus called Paul by name. Second, Jesus spoke to Paul in his mother tongue. Jesus spoke to Paul in his mother tongue. And third, Jesus commissioned Paul for a greater purpose. So first of all, Jesus called Saul by name. Oh, by the way, you often hear that God changed Saul's name to Paul. But actually, Saul is his Hebrew name, and Paul is the Greek equivalent. Like uh, Billy would be called Guillermo next door in our Spanish church. And uh, we call George Genov George because we aren't familiar with the Bulgarian way of saying his name, Georgi. And uh, by the way, Pavel Genov, I was looking to see if they came in. Pavel is actually the Bulgarian name for Paul. So there it is. Well, the supreme irony of Paul's conversion was that Paul thought he knew who Jesus was. When in fact, it was the other way around. Paul didn't know Jesus, but Jesus did know Paul. Now, Paul was thoroughly trained in the law under none other than Gamaliel. That's the teacher of the law who in Acts 5 had great sway over the Sanhedrin, or Jewish ruling council. Gamaliel was our equivalent of the speaker of the house. And Paul was his prodigy. In Galatians, Paul says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Now, as a Pharisee, and in contrast to the Sadducees, Paul absolutely did put his hope in the resurrection of the dead. It was a hope held out by the Old Testament scriptures. Job had said, After my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. And David prophesied in Psalm 16, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
and the prophet Ezekiel, remember, saw the vision of the dry bones coming to life. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. Well, if Paul believed so firmly in the resurrection of the dead held out in the Old Testament scriptures, then why was he so zealous to silence the name of Jesus? One thing is very clear. Before this incident on the Damascus Road, Paul did not believe Jesus was risen from the dead. Though Jesus called Paul by name, Paul's response reveals his complete ignorance. Who are you, Lord? He had no idea who was speaking to him. And notice that Jesus did not say to Paul, Saul, Saul, why did you persecute Stephen? Or why did you put those my servants in prison? No, Saul was told that he was persecuting Jesus himself. Well, how can that be? Well, Charles Spurgeon, the great Reformed Baptist preacher of the 19th century England, said, if you had asked Saul who it was he persecuted, he would have said, ah, some poor fishermen. They had been setting up an imposter, and I am determined to put them down. Why, who are they? They are the poorest of the world, the very scum of society. If they were princes and kings, we might perhaps let them have their opinion. But these poor, miserable, ignorant fellows, I don't see why they are to be allowed to carry out their infatuation, and I shall persecute them. Now, before we too quickly judge Paul, is it possible that Jesus is asking you, why are you persecuting me? Who, me? You can't mean me. I'm the one with the fish symbol on my car. I volunteer at VBS every summer. I sing on a praise team at church. I serve as an elder in the church. If you think there is no reason Jesus might ask you what he asked Paul, then take warning. You might be a member of this church and yet not know Jesus. You might have great knowledge of the Bible and yet not no, Jesus. You may have perfect church attendance and yet not know Jesus. You may come from a long line of Christians in your family, but yet not know Jesus. Is it possible that you, like Paul, have thought for many years that you know the Lord when in fact you have no idea who He is? Is it possible that you have missed his voice. Listen to Jesus' astounding words from Matthew 7. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. No amount of good works, no pedigree, no education, no amount of Bible reading can secure your salvation. No, Jesus must call you by name. You may not lock up any of God's children, but you mock them in your heart. You look around the church to see who is wearing a mask or not wearing a mask and you judge them. You find out what news source a Christian brother or sister watches, and you judge them. You hear people speaking another language than English in our parking lot and wonder why they're here. Listen to Jesus' words. You are persecuting me. How, Lord, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. O Lord, forgive our ignorance and unbelief. Open our eyes that we might see you. Turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to you. Find forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified in Jesus. But whereas it is possible that you may not truly know Jesus, Jesus does truly know his own people. From days of long ago, he has been calling his people by name. Remember when God tested Abraham and called him by name? Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Then there was Jacob. The angel of God said to him in a dream, Jacob! And he said, Here I am. And the messenger said, I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. And then there is Mary, weeping outside the tomb, He tenderly calls her by name. And her weeping was turned into joy. Well, Paul, too, was changed forever after hearing his name spoken by Jesus. Paul went from persecutor to persecuted. From a vision of self-praise to one of self-denial. At the end of his life, he could say, while suffering in chains in prison, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I don't know exactly what it means to be poured out as a drink offering, but I am sure that it is not something easy. Jesus called Paul by name, and he was changed forever. Well, what about you? Has Jesus called you by name? Do you wonder if he could possibly know about you as intimately as he did Abraham, Jacob, Mary, and Paul? Make no mistake, for good or ill, your name is known by God. On the final day, everyone, great and small, will stand before the judge of the earth. Every name is written in God's book. But if you put your trust in Jesus, that anointed king, this does not need to be something to fear. Jesus makes this incredible promise. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Kids, I want to get your attention for for a minute. This is important. You know, your parents may pray and read the Bible with you. But you must turn from your sins and come to the Lord Jesus, asking Him to be your own Lord and Savior. Your parents can't do that for you. We baptize children in this church, but just because you were baptized as a child doesn't mean that you have come to Jesus. Personal faith and repentance are necessary.
my God? Do you hear it, Jesus? Tenderly calling your name for sinners. And he knows you can all. But there are some who need a Savior. For those who repent of their sin and turn to Jesus, this wonderful promise is made in the book of Revelation. He who overcomes will be blessed in life. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name. Before my Father, and his angels. But we need to notice something else in our text. And it's not found in the other two accounts of Paul's conversion. You see, Jesus not only called Paul by name, he also spoke to Paul in his mother tongue, in the vernacular, in his heart language, literally in the Hebrew dialect. This was not the ancient Hebrew spoken in the temple, though Paul certainly understood that. This was not Greek, the language of wider communication, though Paul could write eloquent letters in Greek and is, in fact, giving this very speech in Greek. But this was the language of Paul's boyhood. This was his mother tongue, Aramaic. You see, Jesus spoke to Paul in his mother tongue. The British missionary to India, Leslie Newbigin, in his provocative book, Foolishness to the Greeks, took note of the significance of God speaking to Paul in his native tongue. This is a little dense, so I put it in your bulletins so you can see it's also on the screen. The cultural setting of Paul's speech to King Agrippa is that of the cosmopolitan Greek-speaking world of the Eastern Roman Empire. Paul is speaking in Greek, but at the decisive point of his story, he tells the court that when God spoke to him, it was not in Greek, but in the Hebrew dialect. The word that changed the course of his life was spoken in Hebrew, the language of his own native culture. But, and this is equally important, the word spoken to his heart, while it accepts that language as its vehicle, uses it not to affirm and approve the life that Saul is living, but rather to call it radically into question. When Jesus calls us, he usually calls us, like Paul, in our mother tongue. And we who are native English speakers take for granted our English Bibles and English preachers day after day, week after week. I've actually read there are more than 500 English translations of the Bible. But the Lord doesn't just speak English. He speaks Spanish. He speaks Bulgarian. He speaks Thai. He speaks Quechua. In fact, he knows all the languages of the world. As missionaries and God's word goes out into more and more languages, faith and repentance are happening. Lives are being radically called into question. You know, Ginny and I had the awesome privilege of being part of the Bible translation movement for 13 years. And one of the highlights of that whole time was at at a workshop where we got to see the Word of God being read for the first time by a young man. He came in from a long way by bus, and he was literate, but he was literate in the state language. He had never read his own language before. And uh, we worked with a, with a native speaker who drafted the whole... Uh, they just released the New Testament a, a couple months ago. It was wonderful. Uh, we had, the first book we did was the, the Gospel of Mark, And this young man came in, and what we did is we wanted to see if it was being understood. We were going to test it. So I had him start reading, Mark, and I said, now I need you to read it out loud. So there he is. He starts reading through this, and he gets to these words, and he stumbles through them. He sounds them out, and all of a sudden he breaks into laughter because he knows what this word is, but he's never seen it in print before. And he's just amazed to, to, to see his own language. He struggled through it. He struggled through it. Well, the second day, he's still reading through Mark. I saw him double in speed because he's reading it out loud. By the third day, he was reading it as fast as I could read. And by the fourth day, he was reading through Mark so fast that I couldn't even keep up. It was amazing. It was amazing to watch. God is at work through his word in the mother tongue. But sadly, out of the nearly 7,000 languages spoken in the world today, 
only 700 of them have a complete Bible. We'll go to image four here. 2,000 of today's native languages have not even one verse of Scripture translated. The Reformation reaffirmed the necessity of Scriptures being translated into the mother tongue so that through endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures, people might have hope. Well, how can our 255 million neighbors without the Scriptures have hope? How can they receive forgiveness without knowing the name of Jesus? How can they know Jesus apart from having God's Word? With Elizabeth Eno retiring from Wycliffe Bible Translators next month, who's going to take her place? Who among us will go to an unreached people group? You know, Mission to the World, that's our uh, PCA's uh, missions uh, organization, has challenged us to send out 1% of our congregation into missions. That means one out of every 100 persons in our church. We ought to commission them to go out to unreached people groups. Now, we don't care what mission organization you choose, but who can we send next? Who will pray for this? Who will give? Who will go? And now for the final point. For what purpose did Jesus speak to Paul in the language of his boyhood? Why did Jesus call Paul by name? Well, it wasn't only to call Paul's whole life radically into question, but also to commission him to something entirely new. Jesus commissioned Paul for a greater purpose. Whereas Jesus could, of course, appear to everyone as he did to Paul, miraculously and in his glorious, blinding, resurrected body, it was revealed to Paul that God usually uses means. And he himself, Saul of Tarsus, would be one of those means. Paul learned that sinful human messengers like himself were to be the primary means God has chosen to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. Jesus not only called Paul by name in his mother tongue, he also commissioned him for a greater purpose. Now remember that Paul thought he had great purpose. He was so zealous for his religion that he traveled to foreign cities his job was so important that he even received authority from the chief priests to imprison and enforce capital punishment on so-called blasphemers. It's no exaggeration to say that Paul was already famous among the Jews. In verse 4, he tells us, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. Well, not many of us here today may take pride in our jobs or positions. Not many of us may have as much zeal in life as Saul did, but pay particular attention here if you do. Paul thought his job was important, and he had already achieved fame. But late in his life, he wrote the following words, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul came to realize that his earthly credentials were all worthless. They were rubbish. It's possible, maybe, that someone here today is being asked to leave a position of prominence, to give up your fame, to give up comforts and luxuries in order to share in the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings, to be poured out like a drink offering, and instead of receiving earthly recognition, to receive the crown of righteousness. If you hear Jesus' Holy Spirit commissioning you today, do not kick against the goads. Well, what does that mean? Yes, well, in India, 
it was common for us to see herders. These were not shepherds, but goat and cow herds. They were usually 10 to 12-year-old boys, and they carried with them these bamboo sticks that they sharpened at the end. And they could use them either to whack the cows to get them off the road when they wanted to, or poke them right in, in the side. <clears throat> so you don't want to be at the receiving end of a goad. Uh, likewise, the goad was used with oxen by the Syrian farmer even today. It's usually a straight branch of oak or other strong wood from which the bark has been stripped off and which has at one end a pointed spike like a spear, which is used to prod the oxen while plowing. Now, when a young ox was first being trained to be tied up to a yoke to pull a plow, the ox, upon being tied, would naturally kick, trying to throw the yoke off. And when the ox began to kick, the farmer, all he had to do was take this little stick, put it right behind the heels of the ox, and like you see in this picture, so when the ox kicked, it just rammed its heel right up the spear. And after a while, the ox would stop doing that. Well, in case you missed it, Jesus was the ox herd, and Paul was the ox. It's useless to fight against God's will. It's like putting out a sandbag to stop a tidal wave coming in. Okay. The kingdom of God is going to roll in. Okay. And a sandbag ain't going to do nothing. You will only hurt yourself in the process if you rebel against the lawful authority of the Lord Jesus. To remain in your blind pursuit of earthly significance and glory in opposition to Jesus is to kick against the goads. Is it possible that your life up to this point has been rebellious against the very God you thought you were serving? You know, if anyone told the Apostle Paul when he was going to Damascus that he would one day become a preacher of Christianity, he would no doubt have laughed it as ridiculous nonsense. But no one can resist God's will. If you try like a stubborn ox, you will only harm yourself. Leave your earthly trophies behind you. Do not cling to your earthly fame, your, your genealogy, your university transcript, your resume. None of these things will be of any worth to you when you meet Jesus, the judge of the earth. If you meet the risen Lord Jesus Christ, your life will be changed. It's useless to resist his will. No one can resist the love of God without feeling it in the heel. You will not kick against the goads for long. You must ultimately say with Paul, I count whatever I thought was gain as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him. Well, if you hear God calling you by name in a language that speaks to your heart, then he may be commissioning you for a higher purpose. Look again at verse 16 of our text. This is what Jesus told Paul. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me. Maybe God is not calling you to leave your job or home as Paul did. But he is calling every one of us to share the love of Christ with our neighbor next door. Each of us must be a witness to the things we have seen Jesus do. If you're like me, you find it very difficult sometimes to talk to some of your neighbors about your faith. It's easier to go about our days surrounding ourselves with Christian friends and avoiding anything uncomfortable. But all of us in Christ are called to be servants and witnesses of what we have seen of Jesus. We must not bury this treasure in the ground. Jesus is meant to be shared. One of our new vision goals at Cornerstone is that we desire to see all of our members delighting to share their faith where they live, work, and play. We would grow to see the world around us as our mission field. T. 
To keep silent about Jesus is to kick against the goads. I want to tell you a story about someone I'll call Barry, whom Jesus commissioned for a higher purpose. Barry was a young man who grew up in a Hindu home, and uh, he had a love of music. And he was slightly rebellious, like a lot of teenager boys. And so, unbeknownst to his father, one day he snuck off to his father's cattle fields, and he found a nice fat cow there, and he led that cow in to the market, sold him for a price, took that money and bought himself a guitar. And he learned that guitar and he practiced that guitar and he was looking for self-glory on that guitar and he did pretty well with that guitar. He ended up in a band that traveled across his country, his native country. And uh, we got to meet this, this fellow. And we said, would you be willing to collect some folk stories for us from your from your tribe, from your people, and, and, uh, and transcribe them and, and translate them for English. And so he did. He, went into, he was a real outgoing guy. He went into all these villages, and he collected 80 folk stories. This is how Ginny and I began to learn the language. We listened over and over and over to these folk stories. And he had collected them, recorded them, and transcribed them, and translated them. And then, after he was done with that, we said to him, we wonder if you'd be willing to test some new material that happened to be his cousin was, was translating. It was the gospel, the gospels. <laughs> he said, oh, okay. And he began to take this and he would read portions of it and ask people questions to see if they understood it. All the while, he was reading it himself. <laughs> I said to him one day, Barry, that's not his real name, uh, I said, you're reading this book. What do you think of it? He said to me, Dave, well, you know, one day, maybe this will be of interest to me because one of my heroes is Bob Dylan. And, you know, Bob Dylan, he, he had that time where he, he, gave, he, he wrote those Christian albums and maybe one day it'll be me, you know. That was interesting. Well, we moved on to, to another place and uh, he continued in this, and, and the Lord got a hold of him. And he was, eventually he was baptized. And you know what? That guitar got dusted off and began to be used. And he began composing songs of praise to the Lord, the first songs ever written in his own mother tongue. He became the worship leader for his, for his tribe. And I got a text from him, I'll never forget, getting that text one day, and he said, I never believed that I would use this guitar to praise the God of heaven. It was never in his imagination. I return to the question that I opened the sermon with. What happened to Paul that made him change from a persecutor of the way to its greatest missionary? What transformed him from a Jewish zealot to the greatest missionary to the Gentiles? Why did Paul forsake his status and fame and go through horrible suffering and even cruel martyrdom? Why did he turn from being a blasphemer, persecutor, and violent man to being a servant and witness to the Lord Jesus? It makes no sense whatsoever unless he met the risen Lord Jesus on that road to Damascus. The only thing that explains why Paul became a missionary is that he met Jesus, who commissioned him for a higher purpose. Once you have met the Lord Jesus, your life can never be the same either. Have you truly opened your heart to Jesus? Do you hear him calling your name? Is he calling you now by his word and his spirit? Perhaps you hear him calling you to turn from your sin and receive him as your Savior. You want Jesus for your own, not just the Jesus of your parents. Or perhaps you are hearing the risen Jesus commissioning you for a greater purpose. Is he trying to give you a renewed mission in life, as he did with the Apostle Paul? Everyone 
who has met the risen Messiah is called to be a servant and a witness. May the Lord Jesus be glorified by our lips and our lives. And may we not be found kicking against the goads when King Jesus comes again. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, our light and our salvation, we thank you that you're still in the business of changing lives. You're still calling people by name. You're still speaking to us in our mother tongues. And you are still commissioning people for a higher purpose. I pray that you would make the application of this word effective today in our lives and in my life. For I pray it in the powerful name of our risen Lord Jesus. Amen. We come now to the Lord's table.